According to my fitness tracker, I've already taken 2628 steps today and I got 7 hours of deep sleep. That's about average. This device can even determine my mood. Seriously. But is that really a good thing? How healthy is self-optimization? Our topic today on SHIFT. Do I get enough exercise? Do I eat the right food? Have I had enough water today? Am I relaxed enough? According to a recent survey, about 33% of the global population has already tried out digital health trackers. The market for fitness wearables has tripled since 2017. And it looks set to grow much more, say experts. Why are we so obsessed with self-improvement? And is there something wrong with this? Not according to psychologist Judith Mangelsdorf. In principle, self-optimization is part of our need to keep developing further, which is one of a human's fundamental needs. It's part of all of us. But there is a difference when we talk about self-optimization. This entails reaching optimum capacity or reaching a certain goal. And this is often linked to self-value and status. We try to get fitter and eat better to improve our bodies. But what about our minds? Well, there are also apps and gadgets that can track our mental well-being. And in these times of crisis, many are starting to use such mood trackers. But how do they work? I took a closer look. How are you? No question in the world is asked more often. It's also what I've been asking myself for days now. I've been using Dailyo to track my mood, in the morning, at midday and in the evening. I can choose from five emotions. This morning I would say that I'm good. I tell Dailyo what I'm doing, how I'm feeling and the app translates this data into statistics. There are a whole variety of mood trackers available online. They are almost like digital diaries, a place to record our mood and activities. But some evaluate this information and draw conclusions about psychological health. Can apps really analyze a user's mood though? A person can have so many different emotions. Feelings are very complex. And these apps can simplify complex matters in such a way that they might end up being not useful. Dailyo can only track my mood when I'm using it actively. It doesn't know what happens in between and that information doesn't turn up in the statistics. I don't think the app was that useful for me personally. But it could be helpful to record one's daily activity in order to recognize certain patterns. But to do so, you already have to know yourself quite well. There are mood trackers that take other factors into account. They're quite a bit smarter. Now that I'm in the office, it's time for the next test. Feel wristbands can measure the sweat on a user's skin. This information will be linked to mood-related data. I will input my mood into the app now. Let's say joyous because I get to see my colleagues. The wristband monitors some biometrical data, my blood pressure for example, and translates them into emotional patterns and will recognize them when I'm joyous in the future. I don't know how precise these measurements are, but on the basis of my responses to questions about concrete situations, the app will propose certain mindfulness exercises. There are all kinds of variables such as these on the market now. Some claim that they can recognize a user's emotions through their voice. Others detect and measure brain activity. All these headbands, wristbands, rings measure physical data and give advice on how to improve mental health. Some even say that they can help people to overcome depression, but Judith Mangelsdorf has some warning words in this regard. We should remember that we should never transfer responsibility for our own life and psychological well-being or health to a digital app. It can be helpful to use them, but it's very important to use them responsibly and to be aware of the risks. After work I like to switch off and this Muse headband says it can help. According to the makers, it uses seven sensors to detect the brain's electrical activity, which it then transforms into understandable experiences, so the user can wind down and meditate. If I'm not calm, I will hear sounds of a storm. 
which will remind me to concentrate on my breathing. If I'm feeling calm, I will hear light summer rain. I can hear some very light rain and some light wind. And from time to time there's a bird chirping. That indicates that I'm really relaxed right now. Oh, okay. While I'm talking, the wind is getting heavier and the rain is getting heavier too, so I think I better concentrate again now. I would say that mood trackers can help people to go about their everyday life in a more mindful way. But it is important to not relinquish full control and to not take them and the exercises they prescribe too seriously. I doubt that such gadgets can really help users with serious mental health issues. For now, people can still decide themselves whether they want to use these quantified self apps and devices. But what if they didn't have a choice? What if their employers ordered them to use a mood tracker? Lots of work, multitasking and difficult exercises. This is daily life at Tawny, a startup based in Munich. The founder's vision of the future is one where employees only receive as much work as they can actually carry out. The idea is that software should allot their workloads automatically. So that the software can do this, employees have to wear a device that measures their pulse all the time and there's a camera that films their faces. The idea is to measure their stress levels and emotional states, and then their workload can be calculated. Mako Maya is one of the developers. He says he's not interested in surveillance or storing data, but in flow. This can be described as the perfect state between the feeling of being under-challenged and bored and the opposite, which is being stressed and swamped. That place in between, when someone is challenged but can cope with the task in hand, is flow. But do we really want a world in which software can get such a deep insight into an employee's emotional state? Philip Slusalek from the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence thinks not. We don't want a situation in which such software leads to the surveillance of employees, with the result that someone might be fired if they don't perform adequately, or if they're going through a rough patch personally and the system detects this with subsequent negative consequences. This has to be prevented. At this Munich startup, employees have to actively agree to be tracked. But will this always be the case? These systems force people to share intimate information. How is the data used and by whom? Of course, apps must collect data to quantify progress. For example, in health-related research. Apple has collaborated with academics and published a variety of studies based on data collected by volunteers and their smartwatches. It might sound like a win-win situation, but I'm not so sure about giving that much personal information to a private company. Health apps and fitness trackers collect data when users are sleeping, eating and exercising. But they also gather other information, for example, regarding location. Users often have no idea what is done with their data. Benedikt Buchner is a lawyer who says the terms of use are frequently formulated in a very vague way. At the moment, many companies are just collecting information and don't even know what they want to do with it. But sooner or later, there will be some kind of commercial use for the data. Right now, data is already being sold for targeted advertising directed at certain groups and individuals. Health insurance companies are also very interested in such data. Some of them are already offering cheaper rates to policyholders who agree to track their own health-related data. This is great for those who are healthy, but not so great for those who are not. In the end, it leads to people being selected according to their risks. Users should think very carefully about the amount of personal information they're willing to divulge to such apps. Data protection is obviously a big issue. But do the apps even do what they say they will? There are all kinds of new fitness apps and gadgets flooding the market. They're supposed to encourage users to exercise more without a trainer. But do they really work? 
There's a wealth of research into the question of whether it makes a difference if a person uses an app and tracks their activity or not. And so far, what it's shown is that it makes a huge difference to people's motivation. Many are more likely to commit themselves to their health and stick to it if they track their activity and see visible progress. But it has not yet been proven that this actually makes an impact on health and whether users really do more exercise. We just don't know that yet. In addition, some fitness apps can actually increase the risk of physical damage. Artificial intelligence and instruction videos can help people tailor physical activity to their own needs, but people are more likely to hurt themselves if they do the exercises wrongly and can't ask a real-life instructor for advice. If a user wants to do something right, there is a lot of work involved. A good trainer will have a certain experience that an app won't have, so trainers made of flesh and blood still have an important role to play. And that doesn't just go for fitness apps. Even small devices can have huge drawbacks. A friend of mine wanted to track all the stages of his sleep to optimize his sleeping pattern. But he got so stressed out by the whole process that in the end he couldn't sleep at all. An app might be helpful for some, but not for others. It's very important to find the one that's right for you. This is what our expert says. Jeder Mensch ist ein Individuum. Each person is unique, and not even the best apps can map all the highly individualized elements that make a person and help them to develop. An app makes suggestions based on aggregated data, so it can never be tailored precisely to just one individual. Basically, no user should ever follow a suggestion blindly, but always ask whether it really makes sense for them personally. However, for a person in crisis, any kind of support is better than none at all. So even if it would make more sense to talk to a professional, an app will at least give an indication of the direction somebody wants to move in and how they might want to develop. So I would say, use the apps, but make sure you always question their advice. What about you? Have you used fitness apps and mood trackers? Have they helped you reach your goals? Let us know on social media on DW.com. If you want to find out more about these gadgets, check out our YouTube channel. Bye for now and see you soon. Mm -hmm.